Thank you very much. Dear representative of the government of Alberta, dear ambassador of the European Union to Canada, dear Consul General of France, dear Provost and Vice President Academic of the University of Alberta, dear Vice President Research of the University of Calgary, ladies and gentlemen, mesdames et messieurs, dear colleagues, dear friends, good evening, bonsoir. I am Mathieu Le Porigny, the Science and Technology Attaché at the Consulate General of France in Vancouver, and on behalf of the co-organizers, the University of Alberta, the University of Calgary, and the Consulate General of France in Vancouver, I would like to welcome all of you tonight for this event. I would like to welcome also people from abroad who will follow this event through the live webcasting. I will be the moderator for the welcome session, and then the second session will be dedicated to the panel discussion with a time for you for questions and answers. This event has been made possible thanks to a lot of persons, and I would like to thank all of them. More specifically first, all our panelists and moderator that will be introduced later. Thank you so much, all of you, being here today. Thank also to the University of Alberta for their very important support and help in hosting this event tonight. Special thanks to Alexander Kusnsov, sorry for the name, Alex, <laughs> Stefan Scherer, and all the team behind and all the volunteers that make this event concretely possible. Thank also so much to the University of Calgary for their very important support in co-organizing this event. Thank you as well to the French consulate team, Alice Dubo, Hélène Pont, Thomas Claré, and Pierre Boileau. Thank also to all our partners, the Pembina Institute, the Alliance Française in Edmonton, with a special thank to Anthony Bertrand for his tremendous help, the CDEA, Conseil de Développement Économique de l'Alberta, and the United Nations Association in Canada. I would like also to thank our main sponsors, the Institut Français, the University of Alberta, the University of Calgary, which support will in particular allow the live webcasting of our event tonight. I would like also to thank the Globe and Mail, our media partner, for their important support as well. Thank also to our other sponsors, Alberta Innovates Energy and Environment Solutions, the CCMC, the Climate Change and Emissions Management Corporation, and the clean tech company, Echo West. As I told you, the conference is live webcasted, thanks to the support of the University of Calgary. And I would like, again, to welcome people from abroad who will follow this event and say that it will be also possible for them, as you in this room, to ask questions via Twitter with the hashtag French American Climate Talks. Professor Robert Skinner, our moderator for the panel discussion, may also pick up some questions from social media during the event. Building up to the United Nations Climate Conference climate change conference to be hosted by France in a few weeks, the COP21 Paris Climate 2015 conference. FACTS, the French-American climate talks, is an event proposed by the embassies of France in both Canada and the United States. In preparation for the United Nations conference, it seems important to consider the challenge of climate change not only in the context of shared emissions burden, but also as an opportunity to create employment, economic growth, and innovative modes of production and consumption. The FACTS conference series aims to mobilize French, American, and Canadian public opinion on the COP21 and reinforce the dialogue between experts from these countries. FACTS is thus a public conference series organized last year in seven cities and this year in 12 cities in the United States and Canada involving renowned scientists, civil society representatives, NGOs, political figures, journalists, and entrepreneurs. The tonight conference will be focused on climate change and energy transition. I would like to thank all of you again for attending this event, and I wish you a wonderful evening. Thank you.
Representing the government of Alberta, I am very pleased to introduce you to Marlin Schmidt. He's the MLA for Edmonton Gold Bar, elected on May 5th, 2015, and he's excited to be part of the Alberta's first NDP government. Hydrologist by profession, he spent the last seven years working as a contaminated size professional at Alberta Environment. Please welcome and welcome me to join uh, Mr. Schmidt. Well, good evening, everybody. It's uh, my pleasure to be here. Uh, I have my speaking notes on my phone. It's, I'm really not finishing off my game of Angry Birds, uh, <laughs> in case you were wondering. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we are gathered here on uh, traditional territory of uh, Treaty 6 First Nations, and it's my pleasure to bring greetings on behalf of Premier Notley and the Alberta government. The road to Paris has been a long and winding one for Alberta. While we aren't at the finish line yet, we can see the shorelines of France. It is with great enthusiasm that I'm here to tell you that the days of dithering are done in this province. Now starts the age of leadership on climate change. Albertans, like the global community, know all too well that climate change is an important worldwide problem that every community and every jurisdiction must help address, especially energy-producing jurisdictions like ours. For Alberta to remain economically competitive in this reality, we must take environmental action. As a first step, we strengthened our carbon emission reduction regulations in June, but we knew we couldn't stop there. That's why the Alberta government established a climate change advisory panel to lead the province's climate uh, leadership discussions. Their job was to review our existing climate change policies, engage with Albertans, and advise government on a comprehensive set of policy measures to reduce emissions in Alberta. The Climate Change Advisory Panel went out and engaged with thousands of Albertans, First Nations and Métis, environmental non-governmental organizations, industry, municipalities, academia, and many more stakeholders about how Alberta can become a leader on addressing climate change. The input we receive during these discussions will be used as feedstock for a government action plan on climate change. We already know that there are four priority themes that government must do better on. First, taking action on coal. Albertans want our province to become less reliant on coal-fired electricity. It's the right move for the health of our environment and our families. Our government is committed to finding ways to phase out its use. Second, building a stronger renewable energy portfolio. With many cleaner energy options available, like solar, natural gas, wind, hydro, to name a few, we need to work harder to bring more renewable energy online. Third, energy efficiency. Look in almost any other jurisdiction in North America and you will see that energy efficiency is a key part of combating climate change. For any credibility on this file, Alberta needs a plan to reduce energy consumption and establish energy efficiency options for households and commercial and institutional buildings. Fourth, carbon pricing. To expand on what I said earlier, this past spring, we tripled the net effect of our province's cost of carbon, although it still remains relatively low. But we have shown that it is possible to act meaningfully on carbon pricing for sound economic and environmental reasons without triggering economic hardship. Ultimately, we need to work towards transitioning to a low carbon economy while preserving growth and investment. So while we may use different tools than other jurisdictions, we will be working towards the same goal. Our plan must be a plan for Alberta, just as France's or the United States plan will be unique to their circumstances. Our government's policy direction on this global issue will be made public prior to the United Nations climate change meetings in December. Alberta will go to Paris with a strong path forward. We will go to Paris and we will stand up and proudly say that Alberta is doing its part. Thank you. Thank you very much. Building on the 2020 Climate and Energy Package, the 2030 Climate and Energy Framework of the European Union sets very amb ambitious targets for the year 2030. I am now very pleased to introduce you to Marianne Konings, Ambassador of the European Union to Canada. Hey, 
Ladies and gentlemen, mesdames, messieurs, uh, good evening, bonsoir. I'm very pleased to be here, and I particularly would like uh, to thank the University of Alberta, of Calgary, the Consul General uh, of France in Vancouver for co-organizing this very important uh, event. And we are meeting at a crucial time. We just over 30 days left until the Paris Climate Conference, and we expect a new global climate agreement to be concluded. And we have seen a growing momentum for a strong agreement, starting with the commitments not so long ago of political leaders at the last G7 summit in Germany. It has been great to hear from the Prime Minister-designate Trudeau about his support for carbon pricing and his commitment to work closely with provinces and territories in order to create a more coherent framework for fighting climate change nationally. And as a result of his new engagement, I also understand that Prime Minister Designate Trudeau is going to lead the delegation of all premiers to Paris. And from our perspective, this is a very welcome uh, development and we are eager to start working with him as well. I also would like to mention the encouraging words and action of Premier Nortley, as you uh, explained it here, and the government of Alberta to build legislation that will make this province also a leader on climate change. And we are looking forward to the adoption of your new provincial strategy. It is indeed important that we all work together to ensure that Paris is a success. This means working together to ensure that Paris agreement is a legally binding, ambitious and fair new agreement. And this is actually a top priority of the European Union and we are committed to work with our partners together as with Canada to make the negotiations a success. This new agreement must be applicable to all with as wide participation as possible. The major economies who are also major emitters must be prepared to lead the way and each party must do its share in cutting emissions. For the European Union, we have three main elements of the agreement required for a successful outcome in Paris. First, the agreement should contain ambitious, long-term goals about commitments to cut emissions. Concre concretely for the European Union, this means reaffirming the below two agrees objective and a long-term target to collectively reduce global emissions by at least 60% by 2050. Secondly, we want to have strong accountability and transparency provisions. Simply, if commitments are being made, we want to be able uh, to check them and to track progress. And thirdly, we want to leave the door open to be able to have a flexibility in the agreement so that in a couple of years' time, we can, if need, adapt our, our, uh, our targets and strengthen them. For the European Union, we want absolutely targets that are legally binding. In addition, the agreement cannot just be about mitigation. The EU recognizes that many developing countries want to see progress, especially on climate finance and adaptation. And today, the European Union launched a new phase of Global Climate Change Alliance Partnership to assist the most vulnerable developing countries by giving an additional 350 million euros until 2020 to this fund. The European Union has long shown a leadership on climate change. We have said that we will reduce emissions by at least 40% by 2030 compared to the 1990 levels. And this target will be achieved by domestic action, which will reduce emissions in the European Union. And we have a very ambitious policy framework in place to ensure delivery, to ensure that we have very ambitious targets to cut emissions, that we have very ambitious targets to increase renewable energy, and ambitious targets to increase energy efficiency. And the European Union is on track. 
and this despite, and I would like to stress this particularly when we, we have been faced by economic difficult, difficult situations, we are on track despite that uh, the, uh, we have proven that economic success and environmental le leadership go hand in hand. Even better, we believe that because of our ambitious targets that we had, we were helping also to fight the economic crisis. However, no uh, matter how ambitious the European Union is, uh, it will be not enough if not all countries commit to adopting a new agreement and playing their part in tackling climate change. The European Union and Canada are strategic partners and they have a long-standing relationship on climate change. We have established since uh, many years a European Union-Canada high-level dialogue on climate change. And last year we had a summit between the European Union and Canada, which was held in Ottawa in September 2014, where both parties reaffirmed their determination to work together towards the adoption of an ambitious, effective, fair climate agreement applicable to all with legal force in Paris. And the European Union and Canada will also con continue to work with others to mobilize climate finance from different sources, including the private sector, to enable required investment, including through financial support to developing countries. Ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, there is a lot of work still to do in the coming weeks to prepare for Paris and ensure we can achieve a legally binding, fair, ambitious new agreement that keeps us on track to our below two degree objective. Those that support a strong Paris deal <coughs> should take every opportunity to speak out and to make their position clear. Civil society has an important role to play in raising awareness among the public and putting pressure on governments to show leadership. Today, here in this conference, by sharing experiences and discussing the good work happening in the EU and Canada, as well as the challenges we all face, we can be part of the process towards an agreement in Paris. I wish you a very successful conference. Thank you. Thank you very much. Representing the University of Alberta, I am delighted now to introduce you to Dr. Stephen Dew, University of Alberta Provost and Vice President Academic. Good evening, bonsoir. On behalf of the University of Alberta, I am delighted to welcome all of you here this evening to our campus for what I'm sure will be a very exciting uh, program of events. Let me welcome our guests, um, first representatives of the Diplomatic Corps, Marianne Koninsk, Ambassador of the European Union to Canada, uh, Jean-Christophe Fleury, Consul General of France in Vancouver, uh, Mathieu Leporin, uh, Science and Technology Attaché at the Consul General of France in Vancouver. Uh, I would also like to welcome representatives of the federal and provincial government, um, the Honorable Linda Duncan, Member of Parliament from um, Edmonton Strathcona, as well as MLA Marlon Schmidt from Edmonton Gold Bar. Uh, my colleagues from the University of Calgary, uh, Ed McCauley, Vice President of Research, and Professor Robert Skinner. The panelists, um, Eddie Isaacs, CEO of Alberta Innovates Energy and Environment Solutions, uh, Simon Dyer, the Regional Director for Alberta and the North at the Pembina Institute. Uh, Laurent Morel, President and CEO of Total ENP Canada. Uh, Zoe Karen, Policy Advisor for Clean Energy Canada. Emerson Silver, Silva, uh, Chair of Innovation Policy and Technology Trans Translation in Water and Energy at the University of Alberta and Kate White, President and CEO of the United Nations Association in Canada. And of course, I would like to welcome all of you for coming today and for contributing to the conversation on climate change and energy transition. This topic is extremely important and the University of Alberta is aiming to take a fundamental part in moving our province and the country forward in addressing the current 
and future climate change challenges. No doubt that the best solutions can be found only through dialogue and mutual learning between all of the interested parties, including uh, society, uh, as well as making sure that all of the parties are aware of the respective angles and perspectives from all of the other um, elements dealing with the climate change challenge, both at the local, the regional, and the global level. It is not an exaggeration to say that virtually all of the faculties at the University of Alberta are engaged in climate change research at different degrees and from various perspectives. Our faculty members conduct research on how climate change may affect the Arctic ice sheets, on water governance, on resource development, on the perspectives of rural and indigenous communities, on the development and assessment of conventional and non-conventional sources of energy in terms of environmental and economic footprint, on the social and health impacts of climate change, and the list continues. It is an honor for our university to host the French American Climate Talks in Alberta, and we believe that today's event will stimulate not only further exchange of information and mutual learning in regard to climate change issues, but will also boost the academic and research partnerships uh, developing between Alberta and France. I wish the conference great success. I am looking forward to some stimulating and provocative discussions. Thank you once again for coming. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Representing the University of Calgary, I'm now really pleased to introduce you to Dr. Ed McCauley, University of Calgary Vice President Research. Thank you very much. It's great to be on campus at the University of Alberta with my colleagues and friends and some of my uh, friends in the audience. Um, on behalf of the University of Calgary, du vous souhaitons la bienvenue. Um, I'm really thrilled to be here to be part of this conversation tonight and to listen in to our, our panel. Uh, that will consider not only some of the tremendous challenges associated with the climate change and emissions, but also to look at some of the opportunities that research can play in discovering new ways to extract, transform, and use energy. The University of Calgary, the University of Alberta, and the province of Alberta are in a position to lead in the transformation of energy systems around the world. The research we are conducting, led by prominent scholars in some of the best facilities and with some of the most sophisticated technologies in the world, combined with our industrial and, and government partners, puts us in a natural position of leadership. Across our province, we have the talent, we have the capacity, and we take our, our, our responsibility to heart in the dealing with this very, very important topic. I'm really, really keen to hear what the panelists say tonight and how we move the agenda forward. Thank you. Bienvenue. Thank you very much, Ed. Um, now I'm pleased to uh, welcome Simon Dyer, Director Alberta of the Pembina Institute, for the keynote of the conference on Pembina's prescription for Alberta for the COP21 in Paris. Thank you, Matthew. My name is Simon Dyer. I'm Regional Director with the uh, Pemmon Institute based here in Edmonton. Before I begin, I'd like to thank the Consulate General in Vancouver and the Universities of uh, Alberta and Calgary for uh, organizing this event. Pemmon Institute is Canada's sustainable energy think tank. We were founded in the small community of Drayton Valley, Alberta, 150 kilometers southwest of here 30 years ago after something called this, uh, the Lodgepole Sour Gas Blowout, one of Canada's uh, worst industrial accidents. Since then, a small grassroots organization, we've grown to be uh, Canada's national sustainable energy think tank with offices across the country. And we uh, do our work with a combination of research, advocacy, and consulting directly with governments and uh, in industry. Our climate is changing rapidly in Canada and around the world. The science is clear and the evidence is mounting that our window of opportunity to keep global warming within safe levels is shrinking. This is just a figure from the IPCC, but it shows that uh, there's still opportunity to prevent the worst damage. 
The more we drag our feet on climate action, the higher the cost of emission reductions will become and the worse the impacts will be. Early action results in less costly reduction opportunities. Climate change isn't just something that happens elsewhere. According to the National Rain Roundtable on the Economy and Environment, climate change could cost Canada up to $43 billion per year by the 2050s, with a 5% chance that those costs could balloon up as high as $91 billion per year. Climate change is going to have important impacts on our forests, creating conditions of increased pests, such as the pine beetle, more frequent forest fires, impacts on forest growth. It will result in more frequent weather extremes, from floods to droughts. Since the 1980s, the number of extreme weather-related events in Canada has tripled, with property damage totaling billions of dollars, and water damage being the fastest growing category of insurance claims in Canada. Alberta is expected to account for 40% of Canada's emissions by 2020, and this needs to change. We must position ourselves to be able to grow our economy while reducing our emissions. We must develop our energy resources more responsibly and bend the emissions curve in order to compete in a world that will become increasingly carbon constrained. If we don't act, we'll continue to expose ourselves to regulatory risks from other jurisdictions that do. Albertans agree and want their government to act on climate and take a leadership role. Polling we recently conducted with ECOS showed a majority of Albertans strongly support action on climate change. A majority support a carbon tax. A majority support stronger climate change policies, even if it means higher production costs for companies. Now, climate change is, uh, is an issue that affects all aspects of our economy. But to begin, we must address the elephant in the room, the growing, growing emissions from oil sands expansion. This figure shows the proposed changes in greenhouse gas emissions from 2005 to 2020 for different sectors of our economy. Alberta's oil sands sector has nearly doubled emissions in the past decade with its expansion plans. It's likely to reach over 130 megatons per year by 2030. Growing emissions from the oil sands remains the number one reason Canada will not be able to meet its 2020 commitments and is currently poorly positioned as we approach Paris. For oil sands, we need to set a target of an emissions peak at the level of currently approved and projects under construction, and then work hard in the coming decades to reduce intensity of emissions, moving towards full decarbonisation by through 2050. Another source of emissions from the oil and gas sector is methane emissions, one of the most potent greenhouse gases, with short-term impacts that are 25 times greater than carbon dioxide. This is a, a picture courtesy of Environmental Defense Fund uh, in the US, the US uh, shale gas facility in Texas. Not much to see here. Here's the same uh, site using thermal imaging, and that's the methane venting from the, uh, from the facility. Alberta was once a global leader, leader in the management of venting, flaring, and fugitive emissions on methane. This is no longer true. With over one-tenth of Alberta's uh, emissions coming from oil and gas, methane emissions, in a recently released study, we found low-cost opportunities that the sector can immediately capitalize on to reduce emissions. When it comes to emissions uh, from methane, we should better align our policy with policies under development in the United States and aim for a 50% reduction in, by 2025 from 2013 levels of methane. We should also review and revise Alberta's flaring policy to increase conservation of flared gas. Oil sands get, gets a lot of attention in Alberta as a source of emissions, but emissions from coal are almost as large. And Alberta is a real outlier in Canada when it comes to uh, um, this as a source of electricity. Alberta burns more coal for electricity than the rest of Canada combined. Um, and we get a greater percentage of our electricity from coal than all the member states of the G7. This means that Alberta's electricity from coal-fired generation releases roughly the same quantity of greenhouse gases as half the vehicles on the road in Canada, as well as health-damaging sulfur, nitrogen oxides, mercury, and particulate matter. At the same time, Alberta enjoys Canada's most abundant and reliable renewable energy resources, uh, wind and solar. To begin with, Pemina proposes that Alberta should implement a, a, a plan to completely phase out coal facilities no later than 2030. 
The Alberta Electricity System Operator can be engaged to help find the right balance of system reliability, time lag for replacement uh, generation, greenhouse gas reductions, and air quality improvements. So Alberta has the potential to move from 55% coal-fired generation to no coal-fired generation in less than 14 years. Alberta should also implement a renewable portfolio standard for electricity generators. Renewable portfolio standards, or RPSs, are widely and successfully used in 29 US states and three Canadian provinces. In its simplest form, an RPS would set a proportion of electric energy, energy to be derived from eligible renewable energy sources. It would incentivize renewable energy and its ability to obtain affordable financing and decrease the cost of renewables. It's important to engage Albertans in this uh, energy transition and there's a huge pent up demand in Alberta among Albertans to be able to contribute to solutions themselves. Alberta could enhance its microgeneration regulations and facilitate broader ownership of our energy production systems. The Permanent Institute has worked with several municipalities in Alberta to develop incentive programs to, for distributed solar PV. To drive uptake, we should provide long-term generation contracts and set a rate at a level that incentivizes uptake. With the right contract rate, residents and small business owners would be able to make their systems economic and more easily obtain financing. We also encourage equity involvement for community entities in renewable energy, including, including cooperative associations and Aboriginal communities. <coughs> While encouraging individual Albertans uh, to create their own energy, we should also provide opportunities for energy savings. Energy efficiency provides the opportunity to reduce greenhouse gases, saves money, creates jobs, and economic growth. <coughs> energy efficiency opportunities exist in all aspects of the economy, in all sectors, including buildings, industrial facilities, and transportation. This figure shows a, a shocking stat that uh, Alberta is the only jurisdiction in North America that doesn't provide uh, directed money for energy efficiency programs for consumers. Notwithstanding a small announcement in the budget uh, of, uh, of two days ago to, uh, for loans for home retrofits, which will be uh, operational next year. Launching a new program is an opportunity to demonstrate short-term action on a number of priorities. The most successful energy efficiency programs in North America rely on a strong framework that defines an energy efficiency target, outlines responsibilities for reaching the target, identifies oversight mechanisms, and provides funding. We can start with the framework immediately. All these actions would make our province more competitive while reducing emissions. One overarching policy, though, of course, is pricing carbon pollution and the recognition that Alberta's emissions intensity-based carbon policy has largely failed. Economists have long recognized the flexibility and efficiencies provided by carbon pricing policies. Putting a price on carbon is simply the most effective way for consumers and industry to reduce emissions. We're observing a recognition of this fact by an increasing number of uh, industry and environmental organizations calling on governments to put a price on carbon. Most recently, 43 CEOs across 20 economic sectors representing 150 jurisdictions and $1.2 trillion of revenue called for a price on carbon as their vision for part of a climate deal. This will level, level the playing field and provide a clear role in providing a sustainable future. Here in Alberta, companies like Suncor, Shell, and Sonobus have all called for stronger carbon pricing. An increasing number of uh, national and state level governments are implementing carbon pricing. This map shows the 80 jurisdictions collectively responsible for half of the world's emissions that are implementing uh, carbon pricing schemes. The cornerstone of Alberta's climate strategy must be an effective price on carbon pollution. Delaying such a policy further will only increase cost to industry in the long term and make future generations take for, need to take further action. Mark Carney, Governor of the Bank of England and Chairman of the G20's Financial Stability Board, in a recent speech em emphasized the need from an invest investment perspective to price carbon with incremental increases until the price converges towards the level required to fully offset, offset the externality. We don't have to get that price perfect now, but we have to start in a strong position. 
with predictable rates over time to incentivize the right set of investments and emission reductions. To get the price right, we don't have to look too far. British Columbia across the Rockies prices carbon at $30 per tonne and has seen its emissions drop while its GDP has grown faster than the rest of Canada. To demonstrate climate leadership, we should start a carbon price no less than that in British Columbia and incrementally increase it $10 every year until the price of, conver of carbon converges with its external cost. Alberta's high cost, high carbon intensity oil sands production must innovate if it's to be successful in a low carbon world. Sending a price signal is an essential part of that puzzle and is necessary to make the industry innovative and prosper. So to summarize then, these are a little more, four more than, uh, than Marlon's points about uh, what needs to be done, but uh, uh, a great start in terms of uh, what should be done. We need to ensure there's an emissions peak in the oil sands. We have to consider that it's not appropriate to allow one sector of the economy to escape regulation. We need to move on methane reduction in oil and gas. It's some of the lowest cost opportunities and would make an immediate impact in Alberta's total emissions. We need to accelerate coal phase out. It's feasible and achievable and can be achieved by 2030 without compensation to existing operations. And we need a substantial renewable portfolio standard. We've proposed 50% by 2030 to uh, incent investments in clean, cheap, renewable energy. We need North American leading energy efficiency programs and standards. We need economy carbon, carbon pricing. And there's a huge area of work around trans transportation and location efficient development. Unfortunately, this isn't, isn't an area currently Pemina works on in Alberta, but it's a, it's a great opportunity in the future. Increasingly, we live in cities, and the decisions we make about the design of those cities is significant in terms of reducing emissions. I'm really excited about uh, the rest of the conference. I'm happy that I don't have to answer questions on the panel like the other <laughs> folks. Uh, it was a condition of my part. No, I don't know. No, it's, uh, um, and thanks very much. And uh, I, I guess a final point is, uh, as was mentioned by the ambassador, this is, a, this is a critical time. Alberta needs to hear from its, its citizens now that we want action. And uh, I look forward to a positive announcement in the, in the coming month. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon, again, for sharing Bambinas and yours uh, ideas with us. So this is now the time for the panel discussion and the time to introduce you to uh, the panelists. So I will let the microphone and uh, the floor. Thank you again, all of you, for your welcome speeches. Please join me and thank again all the, the officials. So I, I led the microphone to Dr. Robert Skinner. Please join us, all the panelists as well, uh, on the stage. Uh, Dr. Uh, Robert Skinner is uh, an executive fellow at the University of Calgary School of Public Policy and advisor to the University of, on its energy research strategy. Dr. Skinner was director of policy office at the International Energy Agency in Paris in the 90s, and his research now focuses on the history of national energy policies in Canada, oil market dynamics and resource governments. So, uh, Mr. Dr. Skinner and the five panelists, so Jean-Christophe Fleury, Consul General of France in Canada, Emilson Silva, sorry, Professor and Chair at the University of Alberta, Business, Economics, Natural Resources, Energy and Environment, Zoe Caron, Senior Policy Advisor at Clean Energy Canada, Laurent Morel, President and CEO of Total to be Canada, and Eddie Isaacs, CEO of Alberta Innovates Energy and Environment Solution. Thank you again, all of you, and I wish you a great evening. Thank you. I won't reiterate, but I will associate myself with the thanks to the various sponsors and to the participants, uh, the universities, etc. I do want to commend the, the French Embassy, the French government, for putting on this uh, dialogue. Uh, we're at COP21, and how many of you have actually been consulted 
for COP1 to COP20. <laughs> and this aligns nicely with the Alberta government's um, panel on climate change. And I think it's a, it's, a, it's a refreshing wind, if not a gale, that has blown across the landscape of this discussion on, on climate policy. Uh, and Canada has been given a real whack in the last uh, uh, few months with the changes of government at both levels. And so it's a, it's a huge opportunity, but absolutely impressive that you've, you've done this, and I, I commend you for it. The panelists have been introduced, and uh, a moderator in nuclear speak is someone who, uh, or something that slows down neutrons. I hope to actually uh, get them going, and uh, I will not poison the reaction. I'll try not to. Uh, I would like the, uh, the panelists to introduce their thoughts. They're going to be different. They'll be economists, the technologists, uh, diplomats, etc. But um, and then we're going to have some questions and answers, and I'll stimulate that. But I would like very much to uh, get you involved, and I'll do that, and there'll be some rules for that, um, which I'll get to later. So first, Jean-Christophe. So um, I think this conference is free. And everybody came for free here, but I'm being paid by my government to explain you what is the COP21. Um, well, if, if, if you don't uh, learn anything from what I will say, so I cannot refund you, but at least come and see me and I will give you a, a bottle of French wine. Uh, so uh, basically, what is the COP21? Uh, the success of the COP21 would be measures, uh, measured again these four elements. And, this is uh, just to illustrate the fundamental change of the COP21 compared to the 20 other ones. Uh, basically, originally, we had this, the two first pillars, and of course, uh, Kyoto, uh, Copenhagen, we tried to reach a legally binding agreement. Sometimes we did, sometimes we didn't, sometimes countries ratified it, sometimes con countries like Canada withdrawn from the agreement. That will stay. Also, uh, as you are aware, there are national contributions uh, which uh, have been already submitted, and I will come back to that a little bit later. But the very two new pillars of the COP21 are the, the, are the financial chapter pillars and the Lima Paris Action Plan. Basically, what it says is we want every country to be engaged in this legally binding agreement and to submit national contribution, but we want to say to the developing countries that there will be some money for them to meet those targets. And not only there will be some money, but also the COP21 will be uh, an opportunity for some national entities, NGOs and companies to showcase that there are concrete solutions to help not only the developing countries, but also other jurisdictions like Alberta to meet their target. So far, 152 countries representing about 87% of global greenhouse gas emissions have submitted their national contributions. Uh, what we call INDC, this is the Intended National Determined Contribution. This is the commitment of reducing gr greenhouse gas emissions that the countries uh, will make, have made or will make during the uh, COP21 conference. Well, this first round of INDC will probably not be enough to put the world back on a trajectory consistent with the two degrees Celsius target. Because, according to first estimation, published contribution would lead to a global warming of 2.7 degrees Celsius. Well, this is neither a surprise nor a failure. In fact, we are coming from very far before we engage in the COP21 process. Depending on the models that you are considering, either what we call the business as usual model or the current policy models, if there hasn't been this exercise and this engagement, this commitment made before, we would have go to a direction of plus 3.6 degrees Celsius or even 5 or 6 degrees Celsius. So even if it's not, we are not again, uh, we are not still on the 2 degrees Celsius, this is already a very successful achievement. But we will have to find 15 gigatons of CO2 of CO2 t erased from the equation, otherwise we won't be able to make it. Just, uh, I will go very fast on that. These are a few of uh, the uh, national uh, commitments. Well, uh, I will not detail them except maybe a little bit for Canada, but what is important to see in this slide is that if you add 
the uh, impact of the global uh, greenhouse gas emission of the European Union, China, United States, and India, it comes to a total of exactly 50%. Well, what this says is, of course, we need to have those uh, four on board, but it will not be enough. It is absolutely vital and necessary that other countries, such as Canada, and in Canada, every jurisdiction, such as Alberta, are also on board, because even with the best of their ability, even if the European Union, China, United States, and India do the best part of the job, then we will not be able to meet this target. Well, uh, regarding Canada, I was told during the different consultations that we have with provincial government that actually the consultation that were made by the previous uh, conservative government was not well designed, but actually that the conservative government was pretty honest in uh, sending those realistic targets considering the uh, situation of Canada. The announcement of Justin Trudeau to consult the provinces within 90 days after the COP21 suggests that there won't be any modification of the Canadian INDC, but probably changes will come afterwards. In France, we are also preparing ourselves to the COP21, and a, a new law has been promulgated on August the 18th. That is called the Energy Transition Bill. Here you have some of the main objectives and few examples of what will be done in France. I won't detail them, but I just want to make you aware that this law incorporates the EU INDC and thus will become legally binding in our domestic legislation. The financial chapters is very important. The future French presidency is working with all its partners to build a financial package which would provide a hundred billion dollar a year for developing countries by 2020. So far, we have reached 62 billion dollars and multilateral banks have announced a further 15 billion dollars. France will increase its own contribution for three to five billion dollars and there are some countries like Germany, the UK, who have announced that they will double their subsidies by 2020. Well, as you can see, the title, the subtitle of this slide is the cost of inaction is greater than the cost of action. And this is very important to figure out when we're talking about finance. As you are aware, already in 2006, the Stern Review on the Economic of Climate Change has demonstrated that the cost of action, yes, it will cost us something, yes, roughly 1% of a GDP, but if we just wait and see, this will cost us 5% of a GDP. So from an economic standpoint of view, it doesn't make any sense to wait and see. And also I would like to quote the very interesting uh, words of the governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney, who spoke about the tragedy of the horizon. And I quote, the combination of the weight of scientific evidence and the dynamics of the financial system suggests that in the fullness of time, climate change will threaten financial resilience and long-term uh, prosperity, end of quote. The Lima Paris Action Agenda, this is really the, part, the new part of the conference that will uh, show some examples of what can be done to fight against global warming. Each initiative, sector or individual commitments under what we call so the Lima Paris Action Agenda, the LPPA is expected between now and Paris to focus on building on a tailor-made narrative consistent with a plus two degrees Celsius and a resilient pathway. Commitments and initiatives can be uploaded on an online platform called the NASCA, the Non-State Actor Zone for Climate Action, in order to facilitate reporting and monitoring of achievements, communicate on engagements, and provide an overview of climate action. So far, we have gathered 4,300 commitments, including 600 cities and 100 of uh, provincial governments or sub-federal state, which already covers 15% of the world population. And I know that some of the premiers will attend some of the meeting of the Paris Action Agenda. Uh, for example, Premier Christy Clark, uh, the Premier of Quebec and uh, on, uh, Toron, uh, Ontario, and also, of course, of Alberta, uh, will, will be there. So, where are we now as we speak? There was a, a meeting in Bonn which ended up with a 51, uh, 51 pages text which, to our point of view, is a manageable for further work in Paris, even if there are still 150 brackets. While much work remains, the text is good basis for negotiation. That's the official position. My conclusion is we really need to, uh, be fo uh, to focus on this conference because if we fail, probably it will be very hard to catch up. 
because based on scientific literature, it may be possible to catch up from the INDC emission level in 2025 and still limit global warming between two degrees Celsius. But in, two, in 2030, it will probably be impossible to catch uh, up this target, no matter what we will do, because even if we, can't, if we stop entirely our economy, the, uh, the temperature will still rise anyway. So this is a very important and very urgent matter. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening. Um, I've been asked to talk about the economic benefits, challenges, and risks associated with the transition to a low, um, a low carbon economy. Well, let me start with a major challenge. Uh, the economic benefits are, uh, some of that are very clear, so reductions in uh, emissions. What would be a major challenge that we face right now? So to quote uh, President George Bush in his, uh, State of the Union uh, in 2006, he said at that time that America is addicted to oil. So I think that um, we could say that the world economy is addicted to fossil fuels. Um, the world economy has grown utilizing fossil fuels uh, from coal to oil to natural gas. The energy systems, transportation systems, our cities, and our buildings were influenced by fossil fuels. Uh, to move away from fossil fuels requires a major structural change. But the alternative, let's say, doing nothing, is an unsustainable uh, option. So just consider what has happened in the past few years. Global energy-related uh, emissions um, in 2012 were 50% higher than their 1990 level at 31.6 billion tons of CO2. So the current action plan, which we just heard about, you know, which was to keep uh, the temperature within, say, two degrees Celsius, is probably not going to be reachable in some time soon, given the intended nationally determined contributions of this, these countries. Then uh, we have uh, a more realistic scenario. So, um, you know, when I thought about doing this, then I, I always think in terms of trying to find the best practice. So if we are going to drive, you know, if you're going to go towards a, a low economy, what would be a, a best practice at this time? So then let's consider the European Union. So they have a roadmap to a 2050 uh, low carbon economy. So what are the main points? The main points would be that they plan by 2050, the EU should cut emissions to 80% below 1990 levels. So cut emissions to 80% below 1990 levels through domestic reductions right alone, rather than relying on international credits. The milestones to get there would be 40% cuts by 2030 and 60% cuts by 2040. All sectors, meaning power generation, industry, transport, buildings, construction, and agriculture, they would need to contribute. The power sector can almost eliminate all CO2 emissions by 2050. Transport emissions uh, could be reduced by more than 60% below 1990 levels by 2050. Building emissions could be cut by 90% in 2050. Industry, energy intensive industry could cut emissions by more than 80% in 2050, up to uh, 2030 and just beyond, CO2 emissions would fall gradually through further decreases in energy intensity. So the idea then after 2035, carbon capture and storage technology would be applied to emissions from industries um, unable to make cuts in any other way. So that would mean like steel, cement, and some of the other industries. And in agriculture, 
it will need to cut emissions from fertilizers, manure, and livestock, and can contribute to more storage in soils and forests. Finally, they also talk about uh, the transition to a lower economy, a low carbon economy. It's feasible and affordable, but requires innovation and investment. So the transition would boost Europe's economy thanks to the development of clean technologies and low or zero carbon energy, help Europe reduce its use of key resources like energy, raw materials, land, and water, make the EU less dependent on expensive imports of oil and gas, bring health benefits through reduced air pollution. <laughs> well, to make all this possible, to make the transition, the EU would have to invest, right? So then the EU would need to invest an additional 270 billion uh, euros annually, which accounts for 1.5% of annual GDP over the next four decades. So as an economist, when I think about this problem, then I think about a very valuable resource, like the atmosphere, the quality of this, which is used by consumers, is used by producers, and most people don't pay anything at all for it. So as an economist, then, uh, we need to get the prices right. So I, hypothetically, suppose that you know, water was free. You didn't have to pay for water. What would happen in that case? You would have a lot of overconsumption of that particular water. Right? So, um, so when we think about the action plan that we need to go towards a low carbon economy, then uh, we think in terms of three pillars that, that uh, we would have to follow. So the first one would be to uh, have an explicit or implicit price for CO2 emissions. The second one would be to have regulations to remove barriers to energy efficiency. And finally, the th third one would be targeted support to bring low carbon technologies to market. Actually, we can also talk about another one because even though the plan is to reduce emissions, it's very likely that we are gonna need to clean the atmosphere. So we have to develop technologies that would better uh, take out the CO2 from the atmosphere. Now, let's consider the, uh, the pricing scheme. So how well the world is doing in this regard? Well, only a small portion of global G, uh, GAG uh, emissions is subject to carbon pricing. For example, carbon prices are utilized in Denmark, Finland, France, Iceland, Ireland, Norway, Slovenia, Sweden, Switzerland, Spain, Costa Rica, Japan, Mexico, Alberta, and British Columbia. Now, in some other countries, then, you, you don't have uh, carbon pricing, but you may actually have an emissions trading system. One of the such cases, most important one, is the European Union. Right? Now, a lot of countries, they, dis they decided to tackle uh, climate change or reduce their uh, emissions, not through pricing, but by regulations. The most, uh, the most famous one is the case of the United States, right? So uh, recently, uh, President Obama, Obama decided to move forward with a uh, decision to regulate CO2 emissions from power plants. Now, as we consider the move towards you know, a low carbon economy, then we are gonna have this considerable change, this regime change. As with any other type of situation in which we have regime changes, there will be winners and losers. And in order for this to be effective, then we need to think about uh, ways in which we can compensate the losers so that we can buy in their support for this particular plan, which is very important. So in terms of uh, losers, then uh, here in, in Alberta is very, very clear. So we have energy intensive firms. We also, if the plan is to introduce a carbon price, carbon price or energy price that tends to be uh, affect the poor more, more heavily than affect the rich. So then we tend to say that it is regressive. So in that sense, you know, one would have to take into account this, this phenomena and then find ways of compensating uh, the sources. Finally, I just would like to say some words about implementation. So 
it is all nice to come here and say, okay, so we need to do something about this. We need to come up with uh, carbon pricing. We need to do all of this. But this is not so simple. This is a particular problem in which, uh, you know, essentially we're going to be writing a contract, hopefully, in Paris, which is legally binding, let's say. But then this contract is going to be in place for generations. So then how can we uh, make this commitment so that our kids and their kids can actually benefit from this situation? So this is almost like writing a constitution and, you know, like, just consider the Constitution in, in Canada, consider the Constitution in the United States. So we need to have a, a document that would actually uh, be available throughout time. And then that document is a living document. It could be changed uh, you know, across the time. So thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I want to start by asking the room just a quick question, um, and by a show of hands, who in here is optimistic that the world can solve climate change? Okay, that's about 50%. That's better than I thought, um, but it's still not 100%. And I think that this is part of the issue that we're facing. I had someone ask me once if I cry every day <laughs> because of climate change. And I was like, oh, you know what? Yeah, I think I actually do. <laughs> My eyes like well up. I mean, I'm, I'm 29. I feel like the timeline is very real. The timeline of 2050 is very real. Um, and, you know, my physiotherapist a few weeks ago, actually, I asked him, I was like, when is this knot in my shoulder, like, going to be gone? I've been coming to you for a year. And he's like, in, like, 18 years when we're clear the energy transition's underway. <laughs> I was like, well, A, I talked to my physio too much, and B, you know, he's probably right. Um, and so what I want to talk about right now is I have this thing I call the hope jar. It's not like actually a mason jar that's on my desk, but it's a list of things I keep on my desktop that remind me that we're on a trajectory of change. And I just want to, I'm, I'm going to list these because, I, and I would love to get to a point where I can list these like beers on tap, but I'm not quite there yet. But these are really important trends that we're seeing that I think show us where the world is heading and also where Alberta can also head. So 2014 was the first year that global emissions stabilized without the presence of a global recession. Europe is decoupling economic growth and emissions growth. China's emissions went down in 2014. So far in 2015, they're still going down. Historic coal countries like India and China both now have ambitious new renewable energy targets. India, and in particular, is building a coalition of over 100 jurisdictions that are going to be solar power leaders. Solar power has reached grid parity in many parts of the world. Both solar and wind prices are dropping. All of the big five car makers in the world have committed or will commit soon to building non-fossil fuel cars. In the last few years, as was mentioned earlier, we used to be on track to a four degree world. We're now on track to a 2.7 degree world. We're definitely not there yet, but that is a huge shift. In Canada, in 2013, the rate of job growth in Canada's clean energy sector outpaced every other sector in this country. Clean energy investment in Canada jumped 88% in a single year. Canada is now the sixth in the world for investment in new domestic clean energy projects. There are three technologies that are very quickly disrupting the energy system. There are electric vehicles, solar PV rooftop, and batteries. It's democratizing the energy system and changing the way things work. What does this mean for Alberta? And is there just as good news coming here? Just last month, investors with assets worth 4.6 trillion wrote a letter to Premier Notley, a public letter, saying that they were interested in investing in Alberta in renewable energy, energy efficiency, and sustainable land use systems. 
I think that this shows an incredible picture of where we can be. I think we are in a new era. I think here in Alberta, we have incredible leaders like Mayor Neshi, we have Mayor Iveson, we now have Premier Notley. Um, we also have amazing people like Linda Duncan who have been here for years. And Linda was actually one of the first MPs that I talked to when I was, I think, 19. <laughs> and those meetings make a huge difference when you're 19. And encourage people to keep going. So this province is blessed with climate change leadership. And of course, now we have our new prime minister designate, Trudeau. The stage is ours. And I also want to note that it's not just these leaders, and my previous panelists have said this, but it is our stage now to step up onto. I have been working on this for only nine years, and I feel like I'm standing on the shoulders of giants of people who've been in this much longer. And the challenge is immense, but I do think that each of us creates huge change. One example that I want to give is my friend Billy Parrish, who, he's American, he started this incredible company called Solar Mosaic. It's a simple model, anyone can invest at minimum $25, up to whatever, thousands of maximum, and if you have a project, the solar power project you want investment in, you leverage those funds, people get a payback on their investment. This isn't the solution that's gonna solve everything, but it's a very clear example of how an individual can go outside the realm of public policy and create intelligent, incremental change that brings everyone along with us. I think that bringing everyone is also key to this. Social change is not just about leaders uh, in political office, it's not just about energy leaders, and it's, it's about women, it's about young people, it's about indigenous leaders, it's about first generation immigrants. It's more than the typical players that we think there are. And one of the most inspiring things about the UN Climate Change Conferences is that you see that diversity of voices. So I just want to encourage everyone to be a part of what I think is really a historic moment. And here in Alberta, we have the moment now, and everyone is looking to Alberta on that stage in Paris. And every single one of us has a role to play, not only to encouraging our politicians to lead there, but also helping them when they come back to ensure that what is put in place succeeds. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers of this event for providing me with the opportunity to share our thoughts with you. Just a personal comment, it's been a long time since I haven't been in a US university, and it feels quite good. <laughs> and then I will try to play Angry Birds, and I will remember I'm 50 plus and no more student. <laughs> Not that good. If Alberta, wants better access to world markets, then we are going to need to do our part to address one of the world's biggest problems, which is climate change. Nobody knows this better than the people who work in our energy industry. You may think I've heard it before. Well, I just echoed, echoed the words that were shared by Mr. Phillips last June. At Total, we are fully aware of the role the oil and gas industry plays in climate change. We are part of the problem, and our view is that we are also part of the solution. And let's not fool ourselves, there won't be a simple solution. Energy is an essential component of our everyday life. As the world's population continues to grow, so does the world economy and its need for energy. At Total, we are convinced that the world needs energy in many forms. In 2010, global greenhouse gas emission reached 49 gigatons of carbon dioxide, with more than two thirds associated with energy production and consumption. And actually, consumption accounts for six times as much as production. A global effort is required to address climate change. All parts of society have a role to play. 
scientists, academics, civil society representatives, policy makers, industry, innovative businesses, and of course, consumers. It's appropriate and very appropriate to see that many of those parties are in this room. Together, we must be able to balance energy supply security on one hand with affordability while promoting climate sustainability. But energy is a complex global issue and there is no single catalyst that will resolve the fight against climate change. You asked me here today to discuss energy transition and the challenges faced by global energy companies when it comes to reducing emissions. I can tell you we require innovation, collaboration, and flexibility as we prepare to meet the needs of the future. Knowing that Total's objective is to supply cleaner, safer, and more affordable energy to the world's growing population. This is the basis of our corporate vision committed to better energy. Let's first talk about collaboration. Transitioning to a low carbon economy will require cooperation like never before. One of the ways Total is helping to curb greenhouse gas emission is by stimulating sector initiatives and supporting the construction of an international climate framework. Total is a founding member of the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative. The OGCI unites 10 national and international oil and gas companies in the fight against climate change. Climate is a common concern and not a topic that should incite competition. Hence, the OGCI. Our ambition is to collaborate with the aim of going beyond the sum of our individual efforts. We are committed to sharing our roadmap and regularly and consistently reporting on progress. Last October 16th in Paris, the 10 CEOs issued a joint declaration on climate change, calling for an effective climate change agreement to be reached at COP21. The joint declaration also confirms support for the implementation of policy frameworks to limit global warming to two degrees centigrade. Present trends in emissions are not in line with this objective, and we are prepared to increase our investment to contribute to reducing the GAG intensity of the global energy mix and strengthen our collaboration in R&D on, on key topics. Total alone will invest $7.4 billion in R&D between now and 2019. Total is also instrumental in other collaborative climate change initiatives. We announced our participation last year in the United Nations Global Compact, in the Climate and Clean Air Coalition through the Oil and Gas Methane Partnership, and in the World Bank's zero routine flaring by 2030. We have also been leaders in launching the call for a price for carbon. And finally, we are stimulating a collective approach to carbon capture and storage. As you have heard, a potentially promising technology to help reduce CO2 emissions. We have already invested more than 100 million euros in CCS R&D. We launched in 2010 sorry, the LAC CCS pilot. It was the first European project going all the chain from capture to transportation and then storage. And we injected in this pilot more than 50,000 tons of CO2 into the Roos Reservoir, a former oil and gas, from a gas reservoir. However, CCS still needs to be optimized and requires the following four conditions to 
to be workable, a good geological formation, which probably we have in Alberta, but we don't have it everywhere in the world, the appropriate legislation, a thorough stakeholder dialogue, stakeholder dialogue, we learned in France that even a small scale pilot into an existing depleted reservoir created a lot of anxiety and discussion amongst all the stakeholders. It's not that simple. And finally, obviously, economic viability. I mentioned collaboration, but also innovation. And we are bringing it in other core areas of our business. We are promoting the share of natural gas in the energy mix. In 10 years, we increase the share of natural gas, gas in the group production from 35% in 2005 to 52% last year. Liquefied natural gas alone represents 20% of our oil and gas production, and we ambition to double our 2007 production to 20 million tons of LNG by 2017. Also, as part of our commitment, we have now withdrawn completely from coal production, and we will withdraw completely from coal activities by the end of next year. Innovation also means renewable energies and developing them, and in our case, especially solar and biofuels. In less than five years, we have become, with SunPower, in case you don't know SunPower, it's a California-based solar company that uh, we bought the majority of shares in 2011. So we have, we have become, with SunPower, the number two solar leader in the world, with six gigawatts already deployed worldwide and an annual production capacity of 1.3 gigawatts. And SunPower plans to triple its cell manufacturing capacity in the next five years. We talk about innovation in terms of technology. SunPower's technology is first in class and delivers about 50% more power than conventional cells, and we continue R&D efforts to improve this figure. With an integrated solar value chain, we are present in the production of cells and panels, as well as distribution. We anticipate the convergence of solar and digital, and how we can automate and optimize solar performance within homes and within businesses. Apart from solar, we have been a leading biofuel operator since the 90s, and we invest substantially in R&D. We are implementing today in France the conversion of an industrial oil refinery and will build the first France bio refinery to meet future market demand. In addition, we are studying, whether it's R&D or industrial pilot, several biomass conversion methods dedicated to biojet, one of the priorities growth segment for Total. You've heard it, and we are all aware, a key contributor to achieving less CO2 emission is by improving energy efficiency. We work on this at our plants as well as in our products. Since 2005, we have achieved, achieved a 50% reduction in the routing flaring on our operated projects. And we keep working towards achieving zero routine flaring by 2030. We have developed 70 leading edge total, total eco solutions products that helped our customers avoid 1.5 million tons of CO2 last year. And the last issue I would like to address tonight is the need for energy to be available to all people on this planet, especially the 1.3 billion people who today don't have basic access to electricity. Total has developed an innovative solar solution 
to provide affordable access to clean energy. We try to think outside the box, and we have developed a one go by Total. It's a social business that provides sustainable lighting solutions to population in remote areas. In less than four years, we helped five million people access clean energy through the sale, it's a business, of one million solar Awango by Total Lamps. Our goal is to reach 25 million people in Africa through clean energy solutions by 2020. And just at last Monday, we announced the creation of the first ever crowdfunding platform dedicated to access to energy. In partnership with Babylon, a European leader in that matter, the aim is to leverage our Avango by Total solution, provide financing, and accelerate access to energy for the people who need it most. As an international energy company, Total's commitment to better energy means that we will continue to provide energy to the world's growing population while contributing to the fight against climate change. Transitioning to a low-carbon economy will require cooperation like never before. We all have a role to play, and we must each take action today. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. Well, uh, good evening, everybody. I know that I'm standing here in front of the uh, question period, so I'll try to be as brief as I can. And the moderator, I think, is anxious to uh, do his moderation, so I'll, I'll try to be as quick as I can. When we think about uh, innovation in the 21st century, in this century, we often think about the Apple iPhone, the iPad, Skype, Facebook, YouTube, those kinds of things. We seldom think about the disruptive energy technologies that have taken place. By the way, the title of uh, what I've been asked to address is Solution from Innovation in the Context of Positive Agenda for COP21. So I am addressing energy innovation. And so there has been tremendous disruption in technology uh, as we speak from both sides of the equation. So if you think about uh, wind and solar, uh, I think 10, 15 years ago, we never thought that they would ever be um, economic, uh, but their costs have gone down tremendously. I think Zoe mentioned that. And many countries heading to Paris are counting on wind, solar, hydro, renewable energy, bioenergy to achieve their targets. There are some incredibly ambitious targets. Um, taking Germany as an example, uh, we're talking about 80 to 95% GHG reduction by 2050. Um, one country that could do this is probably Germany. Many other countries uh, are setting targets uh, I think we need to um, be cautious a little bit that, um, you know, you can set targets, but if you don't have a plan to get there, it does become problematic. And so I think target setting is good, but planning is better. Sorry. <laughs> From the other side, we've had a revolution in unconventional oil and gas. It started at the beginning of this century with uh, oil sand. So today we have two million barrels a day of oil sand production. Much faster has been the disruption technologies associated with fracking, that is unconventional gas that's being produced in great quantities. We've gone in North America from needing to import natural gas through LNG. The US Department of Energy was proposing 40 LNG terminals to now um, 
in North America being, ec being able to export uh, natural gas. Big, big disruption. The same goes with oil. So in, in five years, the US managed to increase supply by 40 million barrels. What, what that has done, so take the 40, 4 million, sorry, 4 million barrels, take the 4 million barrels, add the 2 million that oil sand has, and we've put into the market in, uh, 6 million barrels, which increase, increase the supply tremendously. And we've gone from peak oil, where oil is going to peak and decline, to what I call peak demand, uh, that we have too much supply, not enough demand. What, what that has done is decrease the price of oil uh, and natural gas tremendously around the world, uh, especially here in North America. So we've got lots of supply. So that's, you can see what's happening. On the one hand, we've got renewable energy. On the other hand, we've got tremendous supply of uh, fossil energy. And the, uh, as I mentioned, uh, demand has peaked in uh, developed countries, in the developed economies, but it's still growing in developing uh, countries. Um, gas is cheap in North America, um, but coal is cheap in the Far East. So the biggest exporters of coal uh, are, uh, um, are um, Australia and Indonesia. Indonesia is actually a bigger exporter than Australia. So you can see that economies that are growing are going to be dependent still on fossil fuel time to come. On the other hand, climate uh, scientists have been telling us that to avoid the two degrees, and everybody has been speaking about that, and 450, we need to leave behind 75% of all the fossil fuels that, have, that we know of today in, in, in today's world, all of the discovered fossil fuels. That's an enormous amount of fossil fuels that we leave behind, given the fact that we've actually increased the amount of fossil fuel we have in the last uh, decade. Um, but uh, as I think uh, Emerson and Laurent spoke about the need, uh, the long lead time for change. We've got a complex energy system. It does take time to move from where we are today to where we want to be. We can accelerate that. There's no question about that. And then um, you can see that uh, we've got um, uh, the no fossil fuel movement, the after oil movement, for example, becoming mainstream um, with the intent to accelerate the demise of fossil fuels by mid-century. On the other hand, we've got 43 countries, and I'm just speaking about oil alone, that are, their economies are very much dependent on, on oil. Canada is a very good example of that. We, um, you know, um, oil and gas uh, makes up about $100 billion of our economy. So to replace that is not going to be straightforward. Uh, so you can see, so on the one hand, we want to get out of fossil fuels. On the other hand, we have uh, that kind of uh, uh, problem to be able to do it in a rapid fashion. So then, um, you know, what I see is we have two parallel universes that have been created, ones that want to get out of fossil fuels altogether and economies that are still dependent on fossil fuels for a few more decades to go. And so how do we bridge the gap? So I look at COP21 as a great place to start to have the dialogue to bridge this gap between uh, the two solitudes, if I can call it that, but in my view, without disruptive uh, innovation and technology, we're, uh, we're not going to be able to bridge this gap. So I think the focus on uh, innovation is going to be critical uh, to making this happen. And yes, we need a carbon price, we need all of these things, but in the end, um, how do we manage greenhouse gas without disruptive innovation? So I thought I would just 
paint a picture of what that kind of innovation could be like. Yes, there is a short term. There is uh, energy efficiency that's very possible in the short term. Cogeneration in Alberta's oil sand is going to provide uh, some benefits. Uh, next generation technologies uh, will also be providing incremental improvement in the production of oil. Uh, we have, for instance, um, technologies that are using el um, electromagnetic heating uh, with uh, solvent injection to replace steam. Uh, again, those kinds of technologies are going to provide us with energy efficiency something like 20 to 30 percent reduction in emissions or are possible um, to do that along with conservation. In the medium term, especially here in Alberta, we need a very much a green um, grid. We need to reduce our electricity emissions uh, capacity or carbon emissions in our electricity very dramatically. And that's very helpful and will be very helpful for uh, other uh, sectors of the economy, uh, such as the oil sands, which can use greener electricity in their operation, thereby reducing their greenhouse gases. So I think that's going to be uh, incredibly important. In the longer term, uh, I think it's been mentioned, uh, we need to uh, look at carbon capture and uh, storage and we need to make that bet. Uh, the cost of capture is coming down with new technology, and I can go on and on about the work we're doing in this area here in Alberta. Uh, we also need to look at small modular nuclear reactors, which could uh, fit very well with oil sand production as an example. Uh, these are important innovations that need to be coming out in the no longer term. But we're also here in Alberta advancing the idea of CO2 utilization or processes that cancel the impact of uh, CO2 emissions by producing high-valued products, uh, such as uh, materials, uh, um, advanced materials, production of chemicals, petrochemicals. Um, so you, you've heard about the XPRIZE, the Grand Challenge. I think these are important. Uh, innovations that are coming. Uh, we're also seeing uh, some great work starting to happen on using oil without having to burn it. Uh, so not just oil, but other fossil fuels as well. And I think those kinds of technologies for structural materials, I'm almost finished, <laughs> are coming. Um, we have a long way to go, but I think CO2 utilization and um, oil utilization will become important technologies for the future. Um, and I think that COP21 really has a tremendous role to play in bridging the gap that has emerged between the non-fossil fuel world and the fossil fuel world. So with that, thank you. bring to the attention of people. I just found out about this um, a week ago, and I was asked by the, uh, uh, this is related to Vo uh, Viewpoints Alberta, and you can see the website here, is related to the COP21, where Albertans are being asked to provide their opinions, uh, uh, and it's, uh, it, it's very much available to you on the website. So I wanted to mention that if you haven't heard of it, it's a good place to uh, voice your opinion. And the next one is a, an expert panel that's just been released on Tuesday on energy use and climate change uh, through the Council of Canadian Academies. It so happened that I was on this panel. Uh, it's, I think, uh, makes some good reading and very much connected to what's happening uh, in, this, in the audience here. So thank you. I'm going to innovate, uh, not just because I followed uh, Alberta Innovates, but uh, I'm running out of time.
and I'm pretty capable, but I cannot create time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do an Ellen DeGeneres. I actually watched her once. And she's actually very good at this. Um, uh, I'm going to go in the audience because I'm sure you have questions. And uh, I want you to get engaged and to uh, either, I'll give you the microphone for a minute, and I, or not, not a minute, I'll give you a few seconds. And here are the rules. Let's not get into a debate of the models uh, for, cl for, for climate uh, change, cl warming, global warming. Let's not get into the debate about economic models, econometric models. Let's take that all as a given, okay? There are very capable people here who can dispute every aspect of this and, and have a good debate. But let's just respond to what the panelists have said and challenge the panelists on some of their declarations and, and statements. And if you won't, I will, but I know you can do it as well or better than I can. Uh, I'm going to keep this discussion going over the time that we're allotted, but that's all right. If there are people here and they want to engage, we'll do it. Right here. You can say who you are if you want to, but it's up to you. Okay. Hi, I'm Avis. I'm originally from Edmonton and just spent a bunch of time in BC. I was actually really excited to come home and have this come up right away, so that was really exciting. Um, my question is, why are there focuses on, say, non as crucial items as we've been talking about? So our main goal is to reduce our carbon. Okay. But then there's a lot of discussion on natural gas, which is still 40% more harmful CO2-wise than, say, wind, but it's about half of coal. Better, not great. And then we have another discussion, especially from France, because I know it's important there, reducing nuclear which my question is, why are we focusing on things that don't work as well as other things? Why are we focusing on nat gas and not on wind in Alberta? Why are we focusing on nuclear energy and not okay. okay, Zoe, you take that on. Well, that hardly seems fair. <laughs> uh, absolutely, that's why I asked you. <laughs> I completely agree. I think that... Um, Absolutely. Natural gas is a fossil fuel. I mean, the fossil fuel infrastructure that's in place in the next couple of years may well define our path on climate change. Uh, we were talking earlier today that 80% of that lock-in is already there, and we have 20% of leeway. So the wind, I mean, we're in a tight, tight window, and absolutely, renewable energy and energy efficiency are the two pieces. There have been a lot of studies out there that show that we can go to 100% renewable energy, but keep in mind that half of that is enabled by energy efficiency and conservation. So absolutely, I think the number one that we go to is absolutely zero emissions. We have to. Laurent? Renewables energy and energy efficiency, absolutely. When you look at it worldwide, and which is probably the way we look at it, the question becomes, can you do it in an affordable manner for all the people here on this planet who need energy? And our answer is not today. Tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, not today. So if you still want to provide electricity to the people who don't have electricity or to the people who want more electricity because they don't consume as much as we do here in France, in all the OECD countries, what's the next best? And our view is that the next best is natural gas, much better than coal. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Melissa, and I work with EcoJustice in Edmonton. And um, I was really happy to hear Zoe, you mentioned democratizing energy. And an example being in Northern Alberta, the indigenous community that got uh, solar panels up in their community. And I was just wondering what the panel's thoughts were on how we can ensure that we keep that in mind when we're implementing new policies and regulations to uh, affect climate change, ensuring that we're democratizing that process as well and not just leaving it in the hands of, of big business. Eddie? Um, well, I'll just say that uh, I believe that uh, we can make bus big business our friend uh, because, because they have the capacity 
to make the changes that are needed. So I look at big business, uh, big oil, big gas, big coal, as, a, as, a, as people that we need to have the dialogue with to make the transformation that are needed. They are the ones that can invest in biofuels. They are the ones that can invest in uh, uh, wind and solar, and you can see this happening in, with some of the companies like Suncor. Uh, it's, it's, uh, Suncor, for instance, is the fifth largest electricity generator in Alberta, um, um, and others that have invested in, uh, in biofuels, for instance. Husky is another company. So I think you need, to ha you need to have that dialogue, and you need to ensure that they have the means uh, in investing in renewable energy. Okay, thank you. Do you have a question? Yeah. Hi, my name is Wayne. I'm a um, transportation planner. Um, my question is related to our local life in Alberta. Um, how do policymakers or us, in a personal level, make the balance between addressing the short-term local economic crisis caused by the plummeting oil price and achieving the long-term vision of climate change control? How can we encourage, uh, encourage others to work toward the visions? Um, let's say for my friends um, working on a tar sand project in um, former Mary, how can I encourage them to address the issue? Anyone want to take that on? Now, now come on now, be honest. <laughs> Zoe th likes to talk, so. <laughs> I think that if, I would hope that if someone had the answer to this that they would be speaking up. Um, I, th I think around the world we've seen energy transitions start to happen and this is the number one issue is when um, an industry is unprepared for price shocks and unprepared to, uh, to deal with the real people that are involved in, in, those, in those price shocks and in those job losses. And I think that this is, uh, from what I've been hearing, the government is very aware of this and trying very hard to work through what does this transition look like in these types of events where you have a price shock alone, but then also how do we prepare for the long term? Part of it is about diversification immediately. How do you start to stimulate growth in other areas and other industries? Another part of it, particularly for coal power, um, is how do you start to build out different trade scale opportunities that are, you know, not just in Edmonton and Calgary, but in rural areas. Um, I think cre job creation and job transition is absolutely an essential part of this. And globally, an interesting trend also has been that environmental groups and trade unions have come together to really start to work out what this looks like jurisdiction by jurisdiction, and Alberta is in the middle of that. So I think that's a very real question for both oil and coal, and potentially who knows what happens with gas in the future, but um, it, it's a front of mind, very real issue. So there's no silver bullet to, but there are job creation programs across municipal, provincial, federal jurisdictions that can help. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Amir. I, it's really exciting to be here. So, well, I, I'll have a very quick question. I started as a refining engineer. I have a bachelor of science in refining engineering. So then I morphed into something which was more environmentally friendly, uh, re focused on cutting emissions from uh, cars. So I do realize that fossil fuels are so delicious, are great in terms of uh, energy density, in terms of power density, and there's not an immediate replacement for them, and it's not gonna happen like maybe for another decade. But, well, the my concern actually is that, well, like events like this has spread great amount of great amount of say public awareness and uh, and everything and also all companies are contributing everyone is like concerned about this well the question is very simple and a little bit pessimistic well uh, would you agree that consi consi considering that they are like, like all industry is the a very backed by a, a very huge finance and well, the policies that are made in oil industries are affecting our, say, pattern, our, our say, the pace of this progress towards re renewables. Well, I, I well, the, the last part, can they slow us down in any ways? Thank you. If I understood you, Laurent, 
All right. I, I mean, just, just, uh, one more I, th I think your question was, can the oil industry slow down the the trans the transition? What's your example? Uh, I'm not going to give you the microphone back. Okay. Okay, so I've got it back. Okay, okay, okay. Refinery flaring, venting and flaring. Laurent? I, I don't think you're the, you, you're the only one in the room to have this kind of thinking. Uh, and I'm just wondering okay. what words can I find okay. to make you change your mind? And I'm not sure I can actually. I'm still going to give it a try. We put our money where our words are. We have invested billions in solar energy. Do you want me, as a representative of Total, to argue against renewables after we put billions in solar? Wouldn't make sense. Do you want me to say that uh, here I drive an, an hybrid? I'm not sure I should, being an oil and gas <laughs> guy. But, uh, but never forget, by the way, that corporations are made of people. Just they are not abstract entities with virtual shareholders. You have a number of people in companies. Uh, As you said very clearly, oil is still the, much, the most condensed, powerful energy. We can think about solutions where people who have the financial means can lead the way. If you are in Africa and you're dreaming of, how do you say, a bike or a car, you're not going to dream about a Tesla. Maybe I will, but I don't live in Africa and I'm not 20-something. 20, 20 I'm old enough and I live in Canada. So it does remain a very powerful energy that many people are looking to have access to. Does it answer your question? I'm not sure. Okay, Laurent, I got a question from the Twitter sphere. Would Total Canada be prepared to commit to a capping of the oil sands, or I'll add to it, or do you think the market will take care of that? If my numbers are right, I think the oil sands industry has managed to improve its GHG efficiency by 30% in 20 years. I'm not sure it's well known but just to demonstrate that the industry is doing something. The market will certainly play a role, and when I hear questions about let's go for renewables and so on, and again, we have spent billions in it, I'm just wondering who in the room is willing to make personal efforts to reduce its energy and its electricity consumption. Okay, who, da who does it? Who does it? And how much are you prepared to pay? Ah, still many hands, but he, looking from here, not as many as the ones who are prepared to do it. And certainly not 100%. So the market will play a role, certainly. The question on the global cap, this is a very difficult question that I think the government is trying to address today. There are jobs at stake, and when you do what I've been doing for the past 10 months, which is tell people, sorry, you're doing a great job, but I don't have a job for you anymore, and I have to terminate your contract, it's not something you answer easily. Thank you. Quick question here. Yeah. C'est pas une question. No, it's, it's a question, yeah, I know. Uh, first, 
I'd like to thank you, uh, Madam uh, Ambassador uh, from the European Union, the Council of France, United Nations uh, President, being here. Uh, I moved in Alberta in 2008 from a European country, and France. And uh, I was um, uh, wondering what would be the next uh, political uh, steps in a way that to move forward to this change and climate change. I've been here working very hard at the political level to change uh, this, but was so difficult. So what will be our, our, your next steps? In, in Alberta? Um, let's give that to the economists. But, but uh, be very brief, be very brief, please, because there are people who want to ask questions. He, he's an economist, so I had to really moderate him. All right, I'll be All brief. Right. Uh, as I said, you know, um, I think my, my talk was uh, in general. Uh, following some, some of the models, so if, for example, the European Union. But you, the difference here between, one of the key differences between, say, here and the European Union is that Alberta is very rich in, in oil. So, but then the first step, I, I would agree with the measures that the government is putting forward, uh, you know, in, especially in terms of the carbon pricing. But then I think that the carbon pricing should not only uh, be on producers. The carbon pricing should be across the board. Everyone should pay, uh, should face the costs of uh, increasing emissions. And, and then also uh, energy efficiency and uh, investment in, in new technologies or in technologies that have been sound in order to uh, um, in order to, especially uh, carbon capture and, and storage, I think that, that that's very promising. Okay, thank you. I have a lot of people wanting to ask questions, so keep your questions brief. Uh, no polemics. No polemics. Ask a question. Challenge. It's a challenge. All right. This question is for um, Monsieur Total. <laughs> Okay, considering the billions of dollars that Total is investing in green energy or renewable energy, I wonder why Total is still wanting to explore the French Guyanese offshore for oil when you know that the, the environment is very really fragile. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I don't... So, <laughs> you, wouldn't, you wouldn't happen to be from that part of the world. Okay. To, to explore which offshore? Off Guinea. Oh. French Guinea? French Guinean? Oh, French Guiana. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, maybe you know more than I do. <laughs> <laughs> are you aware that there are plans for more drilling? Okay. And, and actually, I don't, I don't know if we have plans or not. I'm not aware we have, but I'm not aware of anything that's going on in total. An interesting counterpart to your question is that there are a number of, of people there who would have loved to see the economic benefits. John Shaw, my question is for the entire panel. How do we educate people about the actual level of energy consumption that they consume? The people in this room have no idea. C'est une bonne question. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. Zoe. I, I would love to do a hackathon where someone builds an app that doesn't track your steps, but that tracks everything that's in your house or whatever. I mean, and so the way I look at this is there's a, there's a half, I mean, like everything that somehow syncs up with like your house, your airplane tickets, your anything. That would be amazing. Um, and I think part of this is that half of our decisions, we're in control, I think, of half of our emissions. The other half is indirect. And so I think you could also do a similar thing to connect people to whether it's their politician, their bank, their whatever automotive dealer, you name it, to start to create a demand chain reaction. Just a, just, just, someone else want to take that on? We don't have to be totally uh, democratic here. But I, uh, I, I think that one of the reasons why people don't 
um, know how much they, they consume is because they don't have to pay for it. Exactly. So if you, have, if you have a price, say, I'm pretty sure that you know how much you consume of electricity because you have to pay your electricity bill. Or, you know, most people actually can look at the electricity bill and say, hey, I, I'm paying this much. But, you know, so if I think that the first step so people get, you know, is to put the incentive for people actually to find out. And if it goes in the pocket, you know, it hurts you, then I'm pretty sure that you're going to make the investment to find out. Okay, thank you. Uh, I mean, I said earlier, you're also a program director at the Pemina Institute. Um, just to correct the facts, no pun intended, 30% uh, emission intensity in oil sands occurred only in the early 2000s when the sector switched from burning coke to burning natural gas. But the, what's most interesting, and our study actually shows more recent numbers that the, on average, oil sands emission intensity is actually on an increase because of primarily more in-situ development. What's more in interesting for me to, and uh, refreshing, to see a company like Total be also in part of uh, a signatory with six of the largest oil and gas companies in Europe, Total, BP, Shell, um, Stat Oil, right? And you supported carbon pricing. I'd love to know uh, what, what the role of carbon pricing is in emission reductions, and how does that in incentivize uh, renewables and, um, and oil and gas operations at large? I'm, I'm not sure I'm the one who is in the best position to answer the economic part of the question. I think we have an economist here. Well, the carbon pricing would uh, help a lot um, in terms of, you know, that su suppose that the carbon pricing is just like $30, $30 per ton then uh, that would um, increase the costs uh, quite a bit for, for the oil producers, right? So, so that would bring uh, a huge impact in terms of motivating them to uh, develop better technologies, let's say. So I think, I think that's, uh, I haven't seen a study uh, that, especially for the oil sector, that looks at what would be the, the immediate returns, but, but I could imagine that that would be huge. point about uh, carbon literacy and energy literacy. If we don't understand our energy system and if we don't understand where it comes from and, you know, we just, uh, uh, you know, turn on the lights and everything comes on, it becomes a problem. But I think in the end, if we want to make changes, I think we need to reduce our consumptions quite dramatically. And if you need a carbon price to do that, then so be it. Just, just before I go to that, uh, let me ask the audience a question. A lot of students here. How many people here have problems to go on the web and find out, find answers to your questions about energy in Canada? You know, if you measure nothing, you know nothing. And Canada, you know, should have something comparable to the U.S. Energy Information Administration. Incredible source of information. I go there to get information on Canada. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Kabir Ned Carney. I'm a second year engineering student here at the University of Alberta. Um, kind of on a related note, um, climate change is, I would say, the biggest problem facing my generation. Um, and it's a wicked problem because there's so many different perspectives to it, from engineering to policy, etc. So my question is actually directed towards you as well as Dr. Stephen Dew um, regarding what our universities as well as other universities in Canada are doing to address this problem within their undergraduate and graduate student communities. Okay, very good. So I can speak a little bit uh, for what the University of Alberta is doing. Um, first of all, from its own uh, uh, infrastructure. So we are a uh, district uh, heating um, uh, facility. So that means that our energy consumption to, to heat and cool our buildings is about 30% lower than a comparable standalone facility. So that's an example of some of the investments that we've done um, 
uh, both to put in place best practices as well as uh, the development of an Office of Sustainability which uh, annually challenges each of the administrative uh, units to, to do better. But I think part of your question is really about what are we doing to prepare the next generation, the, the educational side. And again, through our Office of Sustainability, uh, we do have uh, an annual inventory looking at what are our programs, what are our courses, which are really fo focused around sustainability. Um, so that's what we can do as an institution. Uh, individual faculties are themselves uh, uh, constantly looking at their programs. You're from engineering, so I, I, I know well that uh, that's a faculty um, that is looking at a number of uh, uh, just curricular revisions as well as student-led uh, projects which are really focusing on what are some innovative technologies that we need to understand a little better to understand how they can be deployed and whether or not they are the right choices for society. So a number of things, it's not an easy answer, but uh, a lot of different parts that will together make the solution. Unfortunately, Ed McCauley has left and uh, I've been associated with the university uh, briefly, but uh, one thing I have been working with him is on developing an energy research strategy. First of all, in terms of, of what universities do on campuses, I don't think there's a modern university in North America that, uh, that doesn't have, you know, energy conservation programs, district heating, looking at how to reduce the carbon footprint on the campus. Um, but, you know, we, we developed that strategy among the faculty over 220 faculty identify themselves as being engaged in some aspect of energy research. And it's all the way from the social aspects to, to hard techie stuff. And, uh, and of course, you go on any campus and you ask them, what do you think our research priorities will be? And we'll get three answers on any campus in the world. And I've been in Europe and, and they are, one, climate change, two, climate change, three, climate change. So it's, I mean, universities are, are seized by this, it's, it's extremely important, but someone raised the, the colleague over here raised the issue about what do we know about our, our own personal carbon footprint? What do we know about the energy challenge that the world faces? And I'm gonna pull a geezer line here and Zoe's gonna throw a glass at me, but I've been involved in this since 1968 as a scientist and then since 1988 at the International Energy Agency. It is depressing to me that the agency, year after year, we put out the World Energy Outlook. In 1991, 92, we said 86% of the world's carbon emissions come from uh, fossil fuels. 86% of our primary energy, rather, is fossil fuels. And we said, moreover, more than 86% of the growth in primary energy is going to be fossil fuels. And the IEA has been saying that to its member countries year in, year out, year in, ad nauseum. And, and if you look at the most recent World Energy Outlook, it's about 78%. So governments are you, and you have an opportunity now to get informed and to inform your governments about what you want. Now, I was going to ask the panel a very unfair question, but since some of them uh, would be in a very awkward position to answer that question. I won't ask it, but I'll ask you to think about it as you go out of the room. You get on the elevator with Premier Notley and you have 30 seconds to tell her what she should do to address this issue. Think about that. I'm sorry I couldn't get the microphone to everybody, but uh, I want to thank you for not throwing buns at me. Uh, for not doing so, uh, but I really want to thank our, our panelists, uh, some who are in difficult positions to come out and be candid and, and to discuss with you. Uh, Laurent is in a, a very tight spot. He's French. He's with the big French oil company, and he has to stick very carefully to the line, but, but Laurent, you did a fantastic job and engaged. Zoe... <laughs> Zoe, we love your passion, and, and don't, don't give up hope. <laughs> That's terrific. And, and Eddie, <laughs> don't, don't be put off by geezers, right? Okay. 
And, and finally, I want to thank the other panelists, obviously, but uh, Jean-Christophe, uh, uh, again, I commend France for, for putting this, this on. Now, I, we have a few housekeeping things. First, first of all, we're going to have, uh, we're going to hear uh, Kate White wrap up, and then there will be an announcement after Kate White speaks, so don't uh, all run out, okay? Thanks very much. So, United Nations Association in Canada, an historic civil society organization that grows global citizens. And uh, today, this evening, you've proved that you're global citizens. Can I ask for a show of hands of who has voted both in the provincial election and the federal election in this room? All right. Or I should say, all right. That's how we're global citizens as well. And uh, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge two very important global citizens in this room. And one of them is uh, Nina Delling, who actually runs the uh, branch, the Edmonton branch of the United Nations Association, which I want you to know is an historic civil society organization uh, that has been active in the province for close to 70 years. I also want to acknowledge another very special uh, eternally young global citizen, special and an asset to uh, Alberta, and that is uh, former Senator Doug Roach. Doug has been working, for those of you on climate change, he has been working on the issue of nuclear disarmament uh, since many, before many of us uh, were born, and championing young people's engagement in your future and thinking about your future. Uh, this is a special evening, and of course, like others, I appreciate the, the French government and, of course, as hosts of uh, Paris 2015. Uh, they have some responsibilities to make us live up to those commitments. But it is, as my colleagues have told you, ultimately all of our responsibility. And when we talk about technological innovations, I think the idea that we do measure consumption. How about an egg timer on our shower? How about, you know, how about citizens looking for solutions as well? This is how we make change. We make change together. And I have to say that I am edified this evening. I'm edified by our, our partnership, by my colleagues uh, in the room as well but particularly by you. I'm also very proud of the work that UNA Canada is doing across the province, including with the largest anti-racism and diversity initiative. That in fact, that's another way that we make the country great and we also bring other solutions from other countries that we build each other better. Also a water project, Calgary Current, so that in the same way that we think about where our energy comes from, we think about our, where our water comes from. We, we had the privilege of uh, being at a round table earlier where UNA Canada is working to elevate the work of the French government to bring solutions to the table, to accelerate action. Um, you've been wonderful to spend your evening with us tonight, and I want to thank you for a historic national organization that works locally with you and of course encourage you to think about becoming uh, part of our internship program, part of our new diplomacy of natural resources, part of the branch and helping them out as well going forward. Uh, and again, thank you very much for spending your time in this very, very important way. You are building us better by your presence. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'd just like to end the night with a bit of an invitation to another event. On behalf of the City of Edmonton, I'd like to invite everyone in the room and all of your family members, your classmates, to Edmonton's Community Energy Forum. This full day event takes place on November 14th. It's very affordable at $20, and that includes lunch. 
Um, this, the intent of this event is to give Edmontonians a bit of a background into our own community energy transition strategy, which is right there. In case any of you didn't know, this is our own municipal energy transition strategy right here. So the mayor will be talking a little bit about that. But we're also going to have sessions on net zero homes, household energy efficiency, a session on renewable energy 101, and then um, on some issues related to urban planning, like what, uh, what's the connection between energy use and urban form. So if you'd like to learn more about this, you can go to edmonton.ca slash energy forum, or I've brought a bunch of these postcards and I'll stick around for a little bit to talk to people afterwards. Okay. Thank you very much. It's great that you've stayed. The half-life of the, of the audience I've calculated is about uh, uh, 35.3 minutes. I mean, we haven't lost everybody, but we've lost a few. Again, thanks very much. I hope you've enjoyed it. And if you want to chat with the panelists or whatever, that'd be welcome. <laughs>